Hello there. In introduction, I am Mary Sharp Davis, a clay artist and member of the board of the New Mexico Potters and Clay Artists, where I am happily charged with heading up the member outreach program. In lieu of the in-person small local workshops and demonstrations that we had hoped to present this year, diverted because of the current COVID restrictions, we are most honored to bring you instead a video both produced and edited by one of our valued clay artists, Christine Evans, who will be presenting a workshop on bas-relief tile sculpture. Christine is a long-standing ceramic educator and sculptor who resides in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She will be presenting her bas-relief technique on a tile that, as you will see, is masterfully created. Christine is most drawn to working with elements in nature and to the human form. In this workshop, she will translate a two-dimensional image of a garden scene into a low or bas-relief clay tile. She will demonstrate how to build height and texture on the tile giving the scene a three-dimensional effect. As you will experience, her eye for detail and texture is quite intricate, as is her unique expression through her tile and sculpture works. As you will feel, her thoughtful, serene, and curious presence is reflected in her work. It is my great pleasure to now introduce you to Christine Evans, clay artist. Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Just a quick note, if you like this video, please click the like button. Subscribe to my channel if you would like to see more instructional videos in the future. Also, this hour-long video has been broken up into chapters. Just go to the description below for each chapter heading and for quick access to topics. Thank you. Begin by thinking about what size and proportion your tile will be. This can be based on a particular image so that you are essentially fitting the tile to the image, or you can choose the size of the tile first and scale your image up or down to fit that. I chose this latter method for my project. I knew I wanted a tile that was 8 inches by 12 inches high. I found an image um, that would fit that size well with some adjustments made on the computer. Choose an image that appeals to you for this project. I have chosen a picture from a magazine that shows a woman walking the garden path. I like this image because it includes the figure. It has good balance between the focal point, which is the figure, and the background, which is the garden itself. The path connects the focal point to the background. Also, you can use a black and white image for your reference. It is good to have a color image for your tile so that when it comes time to glaze it, you have some reference for that. But black and white images work well if color is not a concern for you and can sometimes be easier to visually see through tracing paper. I scanned the original image into the computer, cropped and enlarged it to match the size of the tile, and then printed the image. I chose black and white to make it easier to trace. Because my tile is a bit longer in height than my printed image, I will have to free draw the missing parts that complete the image. My tile is 12 inches high and my image was printed on 8.5 by 11 inch paper, so I am missing about 1 inch, a little bit at the top and a little bit at the bottom. You can also just free draw an image right onto your tile. There's no need to find an image somewhere else and scale it to the tile, but make sure that you have enough of a reference that you can revisit while you make your tile so that you don't get lost in the construction of the bottle leaf. I recommend drawing the box the image fits into first. I used a ruler to draw an 8 by 12 inch box on a large piece of tracing paper.
If you are using a carpenter's square ruler as I am, be sure to always align your ruler to the previously drawn mark whenever you are ready to draw the next line. This maintains 90 degree angles at each corner. Next, tape your image to the underside of the paper. Leave three sides free so that you can lift the tracing paper away from the image to see it. Begin tracing. You can use a pencil or a pen to trace, but try to avoid a pen that smears. In this video, the pencil marks that I'm making right now are not showing up in the video, but um, once I remove the tracing paper from the background image, you'll see the whole image is indeed traced. It's okay to skip some of the details in your tracing, just work on roughing in the general shapes. It's also a good idea to frequently check your image, either the one you're tracing over or your original image, to make sure that you're staying on track. Here I'm extending the lines of the foliage in the background to make up for the area where the image didn't quite cover. This is a good time to talk about clay. I am using a Laguna clay called WS-5. Choose a stoneware body or sculpture body with medium to fine grit and sand in it. My clay fires to cone 5 or 2167 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, when thinking about proportions for your tile, Remember that clay shrinks from 10 to 15% by the final firing. For this project, you will need a slab of clay that has been rolled out with a slab roller or a rolling pin to about 3 eighths of an inch thick. Place it on a board. This can be a cement board, a drywall board, or a plain wooden board. The board I'm using here is a drywall board whose edges are wrapped in duct tape. If you are using a plain wooden board, be sure to place plastic sheeting between your tile and the board to prevent the board from warping. Be sure that the dimensions of the clay slab are slightly wider in all directions than your final tile will be. You may decide to attach a frame to your tile, so you will need some free space all around your image area for that. An inch or thereabouts on each side is a good starting point. Place the paper on top of the slab of clay and trace with a dull pencil. Anything sharp will just tear your tracing paper. I like to attach the tracing paper, which has a tendency to curl, to the clay slab by tracing the frame lines around the image with the pencil. This creates a little indentation into which the tracing paper adheres. Now, my paper won't curl back from the clay while I'm trying to trace it. While you trace the image, peel back the paper from time to time to be sure you have transferred the image properly. Use medium firm pressure. Apply more pressure if the lines are too light and less pressure if your pencil is poking through the tracing paper over and over.
If the lines on your clay are a bit light and hard to see, just go over them carefully with the pencil to deepen them and bring them into focus. If you are working over a few days on your tile or longer, you will need to wrap a large plastic bag beneath and all around your slab of clay to keep it from drying out. You will need a second board close in size to the first one. The plastic needs to be quite a bit larger than the tile so that you have ample material to wrap all around the clay. Begin by placing your second board on top of your tile. Put one hand under the bottom board, one hand on top, and flip. Remove the original bottom board. Now you see the back of the clay slab. Place the plastic sheeting over the tile. Place the bottom board back on top of the tile and flip as before. Remove your second board. Use a spray bottle of water to spritz the tile to keep it moist under the wraps. Wrap the plastic all around and fold until the clay slab is entirely covered. This will keep your tile moist for several days. Spray it again when you feel it starts to dry out. If you choose a scene such as I have, where distance is integral to the image, you may need to pay attention to the foreground, the background, and the middle ground spaces. Define where these are on your image because you will be treating them differently when building dimension. My image has all three areas pretty clearly defined. Here is the background, and in this area, very little to no dimension is needed. Here is the middle ground, and this is where you begin to build up low relief with bits of clay. Here is the foreground where you can build dimension the most and at the highest level overall. If you have a focal point object, like this figure here, you will need to place the object appropriately within those dimensional areas that it occupies so that it relates to the whole scene in terms of depth. The figure here is not quite at the very front of the scene, but it is not really in the middle ground either. Therefore, the height of the figure's dimension will need to fall somewhere between the very highest level in the front and the middle ground height. In this tile, I gave the path dimension. Here, I built up the foreground a little bit so that it has higher dimension than the rest of the tile. Here is a side view where you can use the wooden frame as a reference and see that the foreground rises higher than the background. There's more frame visible above the left side of the tile than on the right. This tile also shows how fully three-dimensional you can go. For instance, these plants in the foreground are really almost fully three-dimensional. Now I'm going to go over some tools that are useful for this project. This includes plants and stones that make good impressions in the clay. I have a variety of wooden sculpting tools that are useful. I like to use a couple of tools to score the surface of the clay to help things stick, like these. A pencil can be useful too. I use a stiff bristle paintbrush, like an oil painting brush, for smoothing rough areas. You can also use soft bristle brushes for smoothing. I have collected some items from my garden, like rocks and bark. 
which are really excellent for texturing the clay to mimic nature. Small leaved plant life can be good for mimicking certain foliage in your garden scene. Begin by working the background. I'm going to erase the background lines that I drew earlier because I have something else I want to go there. I want blue sky to appear in the background, along with plant impressions, which will mimic trees in the distance. I use a plastic rib to remove the texture and to smooth it out overall. I choose a plant and break it into smaller sections. This one's a toughie. Using the curved back of a wooden tool, I press the plant into the clay firmly pressing just where I want it to appear. You can use a needle tool to pick the plant out of the clay if you need to. If any of the plant remains in the clay, it'll burn out during the firing. For building dimensional relief, you will need some extra clay, a scoring tool, and a water bottle. I begin by defining the area. I'm going to turn this area into a large outcropping of rock that is visible on both sides of the figure. I score it well and then give it a quick spray of water. I tear up a piece of clay and press it into a very thin little disc. Then I attach this to the scored background. I smear the clay from side to side to thin it further and then add more little bits wherever they are needed. I blend all the little bits together into a seamless hole. Now I'm selecting some rocks to uh, press into the clay and to give it a very convincing texture.
In this portion, I'm going to add both clay and plant texture. I want the background plant and rock masses to seem to be in a continuous flow behind the figure to tie the elements together and to create continuity within the image. So, I draw the outlines of each section from one side of the figure to the other. Again, I am scoring the area where I'll add clay. I'm not following my original image exactly. Instead, I use it more as an inspiration and create my own plant, rock, and tree designs. Now I'm using slightly thicker chunks of clay than the previous section to make this area stand out just a little bit higher than the rocks that are right behind it. I'm going to use this plant now to create some texture. You may have noticed that I didn't cover the entire scored area with clay. I left the bottom portion free. That's because I'm going to be layering this plant texture. Now on the left side here, I'm adding the second layer of plant texture. On this side, I'm making small coils of clay that are pointed on one end and attaching those to overlay the previous plants. I use the pointed end of this wooden tool to make indentations in clay coils that kind of mimic the way leaves grow on stems. Now I'm going to work on the trees. They are located in the background, but a little in the middle ground as well. The tree on the left will be closer to the viewer than the one on the right. I'm using small coils of clay to build the dimension of the tree trunk and branches. I want these branches to be dimensionally rounded almost as if you have sliced a branch in half. So in the center of each branch, I need to build it higher than I would at the very edges, for instance. Later on, I'll use a tool to help me build this dimensional roundedness. I'm using the plastic rib here to smooth out the background behind the tree a little bit and also changing the profile of this branch.
This tool is helping me blend the forms, and also I'm working on getting some of that dimensional roundedness I was talking about earlier. I've chosen a piece of bark to make realistic bark-like texture on my tree trunk. Now I'm adding these small little coils of clay that are pointed on each end to represent leaves right onto the tree branch. Sometimes it's necessary to spray the clay pretty frequently, especially if you've been working on the tile for a while. I'm using the tip of this wooden tool to compress the clay directly onto the background to secure it. To make the leaves on this tree, I'm using this tool to pinch off small pieces of clay and now I'm pressing them directly onto the scored surface of the tile. I'm going for a more amorphous look. I don't want each leaf to be individualized like it is on the other tree. After all, this tree is further in the background and so you can't see as much detail anyway. Now I'm going to work on the middle ground section of the tile. In this area, you'll want the height to be a little higher than it was in the background. I'm scoring this area and spraying it with water like I did on previous sections. I'm also adding bits of clay, but a little higher, a little bumpier, a little less smooth because this area is going to be a section of rock outcropping. Now I'm using a piece of rock or gravel to texturize this spot to make it really look realistic.
There are many ways to fashion plants out of clay. I try not to get too caught up in the details with my methods and tend to go for a more generalized look. And I don't spend a lot of time on each plant either. I just try to get it looking plant-like. And for me, that works pretty well. I'm using the edge of the tool now to draw some lines through these little bits of clay. And I think this pattern actually plays really well off of the rock texture that's directly behind it. Here I'm putting in a little bushy plant right at the base of that outcropping of rock, which is good because it camouflages that edge. I use a rounded ball at the end of this wooden tool to make indentations into this clay just to give it a nice new texture. It's a really good idea to play different styles of texture off of each other. It just makes your whole garden scene look that much more dynamic. Layering the masses of rock and plants really helps to give the illusion that there is distance between each mass. It tricks the eye a little bit. Try to vary textures and marks between each mass so that they play well off of each other. You can try different marks on a scrap of clay to see what works. Now I'm putting a little bit of grass at the very bottom of this bush just to help camouflage the bush's edge, its bottom edge. Just blend the bottom side of the coil, not the top. Now it's time to work on the figure. In general, you want to work from the top of the tile down to the front or the bottom and from the left side of the tile to the right, if you're right-handed, or from the right side of the tile to the left, if you're left-handed. This way, you won't press your hand down while you're working and crush something by accident. In attaching the clay, I do have to score over all those details on her face, but that's okay because I have my original design. So I know what to look for to make it look realistic when the time comes. Because this figure occupies a position partway between the foreground and the middle ground, I'm adding more clay, certainly more clay than I used just a little while ago to the left of her for the plants and the rocks. For now, the goal is just to rough in the masses of the figure and not to go into too much detail. I can always come back and put in the detail after I like the height of the whole figure overall.
Just like with the tree branches earlier, I'm trying to give the arms a rounded form. So I'm pushing up the edges to make the middle section higher than the sloped sides. Pay attention to which areas stick out the furthest on your figure or whatever it is you're sculpting. In the case of this piece, it's the left side, the left leg, which is actually her right, that sticks out the furthest. So it will be higher in dimension than the other one. Now that the figure is pretty well roughed in, I can start working on the facial features. It's a lot of detail in a very small space. Sculpting these details takes a lot of time and patience. Give yourself that time and don't be afraid to go over and over certain areas if you need to. Now that the figure, including the face, has been roughed in, you can go back over the entire figure and really work on the details and getting everything to look just right. I use the damp sponge to my left there to help moisten the clay for attaching. Here I find that I need to remove some of the clay on this arm because its position is too tall or too high in comparison with the other one. This left side is flung back whereas the right side is moving forward so it comes out into space further than the side I'm working on here. This arm was a little bit too long as well, so I'm removing some of the clay at the very tip here, where the hand goes. This is a paisley shaped metal rib. It has very fine metal teeth on it. It's made by mud tools. 
and I use it to remove clay where I don't want it to be or just to smooth over the rough patches to make everything more uniform. Now I'm going to use a paintbrush to go over the clay and this will smooth it further. It helps to dip the brush into some water and then use it. You can also dry it off a little bit on the sponge. Time to add some pattern lines in the dress top. I spend a lot of time on this figure because it is, after all, the focal point of the garden scene. Next, I'll use a small loop tool to define the head and the features further.
using the brush to smooth and clean. Now I'll use the knife at the end of this tool to define the mouth. Her head looked a little bit flat, so I'm going to add some clay material to the top here. Now I'm going to use a brush with soft bristles to smooth the face further. Putting in some more large rocks on the side of the path. Here I'm adding grass at the base of these boulders like I did on the other side of the path to soften those edges and also to soften the side of the path as well.
Now I'm putting in my interpretation of a deserty cactus-like plant. using the rib to smooth out the pathway. Now, the plant I'm creating here is really a fantasy plant. It doesn't exist in nature, necessarily, but I'm taking my inspiration from desert succulent plants, and this is my best interpretation of those. I'm pushing the back of my wooden tool, which is sort of curved, into each ball of clay, which kind of turns them into little cups, and at the same time smearing the base of each ball down into the clay, which really helps to attach them well. When building a plant, it's a good idea, well, especially in the case like this, to start at the very top of the plant and work down, and that way you can layer the forms one on top of the other and it looks more natural. Now I'm going to put some rocks in front of this plant to play off the textural differences, but also to kind of hide the attachment points of these leaves. I'm creating texture with the tip of this tool just to make a different style of foliage now.
Here is my interpretation of an agave style plant. Let the plants spill outside the image borders, then just trim them off. The tile image is now complete. Next, we'll build a clay frame. Roll out several slabs of clay that are much longer in dimension than your original tile. Smooth them with a rubber rib like I'm doing here. I have rolled out the slab of clay to the same thickness as my original tile, which is 3 8 of an inch thick. I am now going to pattern my slab um, with this Indian print block. The white stuff that you see in there is cornstarch, and I use cornstarch. I brush cornstarch on so that it doesn't stick to the clay. So you just take a brush like so and dab it in the cornstarch and then brush it all over your wooden stamp. You only have to do this with stamps that really stick and adhere to clay. Bisque clay stamps usually release pretty easily, but wood and plastic and metal, they all stick to the clay and it's necessary to have some kind of releasing agent. I'm tapping the stamp right into the clay using a rubber mallet. By the way, the cornstarch won't remain in the clay it will burn out in the kiln. Now I'm going to cut my frame strips using a yardstick. I'll be using a fettling knife for this purpose, but any clay knife or even a kitchen knife will work for cutting the clay. You'll want to make each frame strip the same width, which will depend on how thick you want your frame to be and how much attachment area you have left over on the side of your image, surrounding your image. You'll want four strips total. Now it's time to score and slip the back sides of the frame strips. 
I've allowed the strips of clay to firm up a little bit so they're not too floppy. They'll be much easier to attach to the tile that way, but they're not that hard either. They're certainly not at the brittle stage. Use a serrated metal rib to scratch the back side of your um, frame strips. Now I'm using slip, which is basically a mixture of clay and water, and in this case, the very same clay I used to make the uh, tile with. To make your own slip, roll out some very thin strips of clay and let them dry overnight. They need to be completely dry in order for this to work. Once that clay is completely dry and very brittle, break it up into small pieces, place it in a container, and cover it with water. The water should just come right above the little bits of clay. Let it soak for about 15 minutes, maybe 30 if necessary, and then give it a good stir with a fork and you'll have some slip. Take a serrated metal rib and score the clay all around the outside edge of your image. You can see that I have a wider space of clay above and below the image, and the areas on the side, to the right and to the left, are not as wide. They're a little bit more narrow, but I think they're still going to be wide enough to um, be a nice support base for the strips of frame that I made earlier. Now cover those scored areas with slip like you did on the back of the frame strips. Lay out parallel strips, either the top and the bottom strips or the two side strips as I have done here. You can use the side of a yardstick to tap the frame into alignment. Be sure to press down on both the top of the frame and the sides of the frame to really adhere this strip of clay to the main tile. Attach the last two frame strips. Make sure they overlap the two original ones. I have cut these shorter frame strips to be the same width as the tile with the frame included. Don't attach these two frame strips very securely at all. In fact, don't pat them down, just let them sit there. You will need a knife to cut mitered corners.
slice through the top frame strip and the bottom frame strip at a 45 degree angle, but stop before you get to the tile itself. Lift the top frame strip to remove the cut section below it. Align the two cut edges together and then gently pat them down to connect to the slab below. Use the yardstick again to push the frame piece into place. Pat the frame down to adhere it. Trim the underlying tile wherever it sticks out beyond the frame. The tile is complete. To dry the tile, it's best to do so on something like a drywall board that will pull the moisture out from underneath. So be sure just to remove the plastic that's underneath the tile, slide it out carefully or very carefully flip your tile onto some foam and then remove the plastic from the back. Dry the tile slowly under loose plastic for four to six days. Then remove the plastic and layer several thick terry cloth towels over the tile. Cover the towels with the plastic bag and leave it that way for at least another week. Then let it dry uncovered until it is bone dry to the touch and no longer cool and then fire it in the kiln. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope this video has been helpful. Please feel free to leave comments and questions below.